grace. 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 It is good uh, to be back to our track to the Bible. Uh, I don't. I don't know about you, but. Uh, I have really enjoyed our, our time track with the track of the Bible because it's opened up the door for me to be able to spend more time in passages that before I I had read through in devotionals or I had spent uh, referenced um, from time to time, but not really spent time digging into them. And so I'm getting a whole lot more out of it than I was before. And if nothing else, and it's challenged me in a few areas, but um, above anything else, I think it has uh, strengthened my already firmly held belief in the continuity of scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation. So that's been good. Yes. Just, uh -huh. just makes a point of what I was saying about Sunday about the stories. Mm -hmm. It's the stories. Yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's not just, you know, God did this, God did this, God did this, but these are actually people like... Their life, yeah. Their stories they're, about people. Their testimonies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Their testimonies. Yeah. I don't... I, I know that's the word I probably should use, but that's... It's fine. No, mm -hmm. both are valid. It's true. So their life is a living testimony. So now it's been um, three weeks since uh, the sixth of the sixteenth of December. So which is when the last time we met. So I imagine that you've forgotten where we left off. Uh, we were looking at the two kings of Israel, uh, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and Benjamin, and Ahab, king over the rest of Israel. Uh, Jehoshaphat was a good king, not a perfect king, but a good king. Ahab, king of Israel, on the other hand, was a wicked king. Uh, God's testimony of this man was that none had sold themselves to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab had, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols. That was God's testimony of this man. Not a good one to have, right? So, uh, now I, so I entitled our, our last message, um, Ahab, King, Warrior, and Big Baby. Uh, I did this because he was, in fact, king, though uh, he only acted like it in times of war. Um, in nearly all other matters, at least as far as uh, scripture recorded, uh, he was led about by his sick little wife, uh, Jezebel. Uh, more than once, we see him reacting like a big baby to news he disliked, curling up in near fetal position on his bed. It isn't really even hard to imagine him sucking his thumb. Uh, in the verbal imagery that the passages provide for us. So, now I want you to remember that though Jehoshaphat had been, by all natural accounts, an exemplary king, he also showed himself to have a character flaw which led him to compromise. Uh, we read one of those compromises last time. We'll read another one tonight. Now, within the sanctity of his own kingdom, meaning in Judah and Benjamin, over which he reigned, uh, he seemed to rule with authority uh, from a place of strong moral conviction. Uh, though the biblical account of this man's life only, uh, throughout that the account of his life, only three things are ever mentioned as worthy of God's disapproval, and two of them had to do with his interactions with his neighboring kings of Israel, namely Ahab at first, and then later on his son, Ahab's son, um, uh, Ahaziah. In both cases, Jehoshaphat either lacked confidence or, more likely, um, he just succumbed to peer pressure uh, rather than taking a stance for righteousness. Now, this in itself is a lesson because Ahab was, as we mentioned earlier, a big baby. Um, in all likelihood, he would not have retaliated against Je Jehoshaphat should he have taken a strong stance for what was right by not accompanying Ahab to war against Ramoth Gilead. If he just said, no, I'm, I'm not going to go. Uh, chances are Ahab would have proud, probably pouted like he seemed to do every time he didn't get his way, but I doubt he would have retaliated. Um, the lesson here is that often those who we are most intimidated by are themselves highly intimidated and childlike. Uh, there's usually not a valid, even a natural valid reason for intimidation when you're dealing with other humans. They're just a human. Uh, like Paul said, what can man do to me? Uh, sometimes that can be what man can do is actually quite extreme. But in most cases, it's bluster. It's puffing out the chest without uh, a whole lot to back it up. Yes, uh huh. I'm sorry, I have something to say about that because sure. you talk about intimidation. 
Mm-hmm. When I first met Michelle and Rob, yeah, you told me, yeah, mm-hmm. I was intimidated by them because of you know just just their presence, outside presence. Mm-hmm. But once I got to know them, they're just like me, and like you know, yeah. one of God's children. You know, they sin, they do wrong. You know, just like me. But mm-hmm. I was very intimidated by them mm-hmm. when I first met them. So it's and easy. now it's nothing. Yeah, now it's nothing because you know better, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, um. Ahab, or rather, uh, for Jeho- Jehoshaphat, the breaking point for his, where his morality would cripple him sometimes, uh, seemed to have been in keeping the peace. Uh, his reason may have been fear of conflict between the divided kingdom of Israel, because you know Israel was in fact divided. He ruled over two of the tribes, and the other king reigned over the rest of Israel. And he didn't want conflict between the two sides, obviously. And, I mean, who would? It was. Uh, it may have been, though, something as simple, like I said, as peer pressure. But in both instances of his life where he compromised, it was during interactions with his neighboring king over the rest of Israel. Uh, king Jehoshaphat seemed to have no problem going out into the public of his domain, meaning Judah and Benjamin, and commanding religious reform. And, and he didn't do this from the comfort of his throne and sent other people out. He literally went himself into the various towns and villages and provinces and demanded reformation, a return to the Lord and a destroying of idols. So this can't just simply be a case of a man who is afraid of other people's faces. Uh, it seems as though he was a man who would ha- was more easily intimidated by someone he might consider his peer, like another king, right? So, and, and that's at least the only time it seems to crop up. In the face of Ahab and his son, Jehoshaphat's actions were more about peacekeeping than peacemaking. And you may remember that we've covered the difference between these several times over the years, but it's been a while, so I'll just briefly tell you the difference. Peacekeeping is always horizontal. It's external, and it's superficial. It will do anything, say anything in order to avoid, dissuade, or calm conflict. Most often it requires a lowering lowering of a person's moral convictions, wagering that the outcome of a lack of external strife is solid enough grounds to somehow uh, to allow for some flexibility in your morality. That that most of the cases that's what, what goes on. Uh, you know, they, 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 they weighed the odds and they're thinking, well, you know what? I really don't want conflict. And so, yes, I might have to say a white lie in order to avoid it. But I think that's better than a full-blown conflict. So you see, they're, willing, they're wagering that um, lowering their morality at one level is worth that compromise is worth the end result of a fake peace. But it's not really real peace because there's no agreement. There's just a superficial cessation of firing. I'm not going to shoot at you, but we really aren't friends. You know, I mean, so there really isn't peace. Peacemaking, on the other hand, is mostly vertical between us and God. It's internal and substantively real. It concerns itself with attempting to convince those who oppose godly living to align themselves with God's will in agreement and obedience. The result of which is that person now has peace with God, and as a result, they also have peace with you, right? So that's peacemaking. Peacekeeping is just keeping the status quo and trying not to ruffle people's feathers and not stir up the waters and doesn't require any agreement or meeting eye to eye or settling of issues. It's avoidance, and most of the time it requires compromise. Peacemaking is not easy. It requires confrontation, it requires you to say the hard things that you don't want to say, and it's always with the view of reconciliation of the person with God first and with you secondarily. And that is the thing that uh, a, uh, um, Jehoshaphat seemed to be weak in. Um, he was more of a, a peacekeeper than a peacemaker. So you can see that. It showed up in Je- Jehoshaphat, showed himself to be a bit of a peacekeeper in several of his actions. He quickly allied himself with Ahab, and only requested, if you remember, the counsel of God after he had already done so. He had already told Ahab, oh, my people are your people. My warriors are your warriors. Hey, you know what? Maybe we should consult a prophet. See, he already committed himself. Then he asked for a prophet. 
not exactly the best order to do things in, right? Uh, Jehoshaphat's arena, uh, um, well, he seemed that to lack a backbone, uh, just to put it simply. Because uh, even after, if you remember, even after the prophet came to him, uh, came to Ahab and appeared before him and told him, you know, if you go into war, Ahab, you will die, he still went with him. And so not only was he someone who caved into peer pressure, but he lacked a spine to, once he had given in, to back out. At that point, even though he had given in before, he should have said, you know what? I retract what I said. I should have never said that. Uh, my first obligation is honor the Lord and honor the position he's given me as king over Judah and Benjamin. And I'm sorry I cannot accompany you to war. But instead, he went with him. Uh, this just goes to show that while a person may be very upright in many areas of their life, there always have, there's always areas of weakness. Jehoshaphat's area of weakness seemed to not be willing to go far enough in his stance for righteousness. Specifically, he was a man who was afraid of facing up to others that he saw as equal, or in some other way, maybe even superior to him. Now, at the end of our last time together, we saw Ahab and Jezebel dying by the sovereign hand and decree and power of God. If you remember, a warrior of Syria had shot an arrow, quote-unquote, at random, and, you know, and it, it, it soars through the air over the countless heads of other warriors and somehow settles down in the weak spot in his chest armor. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that this arrow was guided by the hand of God or at least by an angel at God's command. This was God's design. And uh, there was, it may seem random, but it's kind of like we've uh, talked about before. The Bible says uh, the casting of the lot into the lap, that's in man's power. But his every decision comes from God. You know, so I mean, you know, plucking the bow and letting the arrow fly, that's the casting of the lot. But, you know, whether or not it, it winds up giving you uh, um, snake eyes or not is in God's hands, right? And uh, so this is the, the result of what happened. So now that's, that's where we left off. We left off uh, uh, with Jehoshaphat leaving that battle and returning back home to Jerusalem. So we pick up where we left off in Second Chronicles chapter 19, starting in verse 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 19, starting verse 1, it says, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned to his home in Jerusalem in peace. Then Jehu, son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to confront him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Do you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the Lord's wrath is upon you. However, some good is found in you, for you have removed the astropoles from the land and have decided to seek God. Now, I want you to notice that this is an awful lot like, it brought to my mind instantly, what Jesus did with the seven churches. He brought up the things, now it's in a different order. In this case, he brought up what he did bad and then brought up the good. But if you look at what Jesus did with the seven churches, he addressed both. And you notice also when Jesus addressed the churches, you find that the good did not outweigh the bad. They were both weighed equally based on their own merits. God didn't say, well, you know, you've done a lot of good things over here. You've done one bad thing, so eh, you're looking pretty good. No, no, no. He, he let the good stand for what it was and the bad stand for what it was. And he said, and he dealt with the bad. He says, you know what? You need to deal with that. It's good that you've done this. You've got my pat on the back and my approval on that. But this right here needs to change, better change, or I'm going to do something about it. Right? So in God's economy, good never outweighs bad. Every action stands on its own before him. Now, um, so this type of confrontation should very, seem very familiar to us. Uh, now, this sec next section, as we're about to go into in verse 4, uh, it talks about how actions speak louder than words. Uh, while there's no record of Jehoshaphat's reaction to this prophet coming to him and calling him on the carpet... Um, there is a continuation of godly behavior from that point on. So, though he doesn't, there's no record of him verbally repenting, like you see with David when he's confronted. There's no verbal record or written record of his reaction at all. But what you do see is a life lived. Well, that's proof that there was obviously some type of repentance in him. So, picking up in verse 4, it says, Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, and once again, he went out among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim. Notice the words, 
once again. This isn't the first time he left his throne and went out into his kingdom physically, right? This is something that should be admired. This man went out and did what he should do. It's, it's reminiscent of many presidents in the past, not just uh, Trump, but other, other presidents, both Democratic and Republican, who have in the past gone and visited the troops during time of war or have during Thanksgiving or Christmas gone to, you know, a particular hotbed and done whatever they could to either serve a meal or to give an encouraging word or something. Uh, they were out there with the people who represented the kingdom and rather than just uh, being in their pious position in safety behind, you know, armed guards on a throne, uh, they went out to where the people were and that uh, is uh, admirable. And that's what this man did. So uh, Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, and once again, he went out among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. This, I, I gotta tell you, this isn't a bad guy, you know? He's going out there, and he's essentially doing the work of a preacher and encouraging the hearts of the of Israelites to come back to devotion towards God. And while he was out there, he appointed judges in all the fortified cities of the land of Judah, city by city. This isn't something he did in an afternoon. This took some time. He was clearly dedicated to reform and to establishing a, a return to Judaism and allegiance to God in the hearts of God's people. Again, all very, very good things. So he appointed judges in all the fortified cities of the land of Judah, city by city. Then he said to the judges, consider what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the matter of judgment. And now may the terror of the Lord remain upon you. Watch what you do, for there is no injustice or partiality or taking of bribes with the Lord our God. Wow. I mean, this is awesome. I mean, uh, he, he's going around and he's appointing judges, and then he has a private council with them and charges them with the weight of their position, knowing that you stand before God, and what you say, you are speaking on God's behalf. You better make sure it's what God would have said. Let the fear of the Lord rest upon you and know that God doesn't take bribes and is not someone who uh, who shows favoritism in his judgment, right? Uh, I tell you, the judges in our, in our land could take some real major pointers from that. Verse 8, Jehoshaphat also appointed in Jerusalem some of the Levites and priests and some of the heads of the Israelite families for rendering the Lord's judgments and for settling disputes of the residents of Jerusalem. He commanded them, saying, In the fear of the Lord, with integrity, and with a whole heart, you are to do the following. We're all ready. I don't even know what he's going to tell them, but he's telling them to do it the right way, right? He says, In the fear of the Lord, with integrity, and with all of your heart, you are to do what I'm about to tell you. For every dispute that comes to you from your brothers who dwell in their cities, whether it regards differences of blood guilt, law, commandment, statutes, or judgments, you are to warn them so that they will not incur guilt before the Lord and wrath will not come on you or your brothers. Do this and you will not incur guilt. Note that Amariah, the chief priest, is over you in all matters related to the Lord. And Zebediah, son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, in all matters related to the king. And the Levites are officers in your presence. Be strong. May the Lord be with those who do what is good. So here we have a heart of wisdom in King Jehoshaphat. He rightly understands his own personal position and authority um, and his purpose before God is to help steer the hearts of the people back towards allegiance to God. He also understands the nature of justice and the job of judges and commands them accordingly. He has a command of sphere authority as well and places due emphasis on who is in charge of 
spiritual matters as compared to those uh, who are in charge of natural issues regarding the kingdom. So it, the man not is, is really a very good king. He understands spirit authority, understands his own authority, understands that everyone is underneath God and that every heart needs to seek him. All hearts need to live in fear of the Lord and walk in integrity and, and, and honor the, the commandments of God. In all things mentioned, Jehoshaphat is a good and noble-hearted king. Uh, so let's go on to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, starting in verse 1. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, together with some of the Munites, came to fight against Jehoshaphat. Now, there, here we may have a difference in translation. Many translations, instead of mentioning the, Mu, Munite, the Munites, will say others beside the Ammonites. They'll say that. Okay, This is because that phrase is considered by some to be a, a, a name. Of a, of a certain people called Mohammedism, uh, I'm sorry, Mohana, Mohammedim, which is hard to say, or Mahunim, which is mentioned specifically later on if we get to Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse 7. These people dwelt in Mount Seir. The people that accompanied them, uh, the, the Moabites and the Ammonites are people who lived near Mount Seir, which isn't far from the Moabites and the Ammonites. Uh, um, they were either a branch of the old Edomite race, which were descended from Esau, you guys remember that, or a separate tribe who were settled there. Those coming with the Moabites and the Ammonites were from Mount Seir. And again, we'll see that. Uh, actually, it's even brought up in this very same passage from Jehoshaphat's own mouth in verse 10. But I, I just wanted to bring out that there is a discrepancy there in the way it's worded. But that phrase, and others beside the Ammonites... Is actually a phrase uh, is is understood by some translators to be a phrase rather than a proper name. The proper name would be what I said, the Munites, and uh, later on is brought up in verse ten. So we'll keep on going now. Verse two: People came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast multitude from beyond the Dead Sea and from Edom have come to fight against you, and they already they are already in Hazon Tamar, that is in Engedi. Jehoshaphat was afraid, so he resolved to seek the Lord. That's not a bad response, is it? I mean, while fear is not a good response, seeking the Lord is, right? Uh, David himself said in Psalm 56, 3, that what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. This is Jehoshaphat's response as well. You do not see the Lord, uh, I mean, so you do not seek the Lord in times of trouble if in your view, He's not a trusted source of help. He sought the Lord because he believed the Lord be the one that could save him. If anyone could save him, the Lord could. So now Jehoshaphat begins to lead here by example. I want you to notice that as a godly leader and king, Jehoshaphat here, as we're about to read, humbles himself before the people, much like David had, much like Solomon had. And when he does this, he prays. This is very significant. It is the one thing to do this privately. But that's not the way this is done. It, it's quite another if you do this before all the people. Unlike the political nods towards God that is popular in the Western politics, both Democrats and, 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 and um, liberals and, and Republicans and various forms of conservatives, almost always, at least until recent years, give some type of a verbal nod towards God, quote-unquote, whoever that is, you know. They'll say something about, may God be with us or may God bless us. Now, those days are, are departing because there's such a, sh a, a, a harsh pushback from that. But traditionally, it's been something that most Western politicians will say on one. It's kind of like kissing babies. They might hate babies, but they'll never tell you that because this is what, you know, sells votes. So they'll always make a verbal nod towards God and the need for his power. But you need to understand, the day that they were living in, showing any sign of weakness, any sign of external need beyond your own power, could easily have been interpreted, interpreted by a kingdom as a sign of weakness. And this king didn't seem to care. He didn't care if the people interpreted his words and his thoughts and his bowing down before God in front of everybody as a sign of weakness or not. He did it because it was what was in his heart. 
And it's the same thing David did. It's the same thing that Solomon did. And I, I think that that's significant. Um, uh, his focus was upon God, acknowledging God and his authority and power in the middle of this threat. He expressed humility and bowing before him, and he requested salvation from him, saving of his natural enemies, from his natural enemies. So let's pick up in the last part of verse 3. It says, So he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Now, in which we already realized that we've established in the past, all of Judah now was more like a province, which included, you know, Benjamin as well. So this was, he was proclaiming a fast throughout his region. Uh, so, who gathered to seek the Lord, they even came from all the cities of Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the Lord's temple before the new courtyard. Now, you should already see what's coming here. If you don't, Hopefully, it'll ring a bell as we read it. He said, Lord God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? And do you not rule, rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, and no one can stand against you. Are you not our God who drove out all the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and who gave it, uh, who gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in the land and have built you a sanctuary for in it your name, I'm sorry, in it for your name. And you have said, if disaster comes on us, sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this temple and before you for your name is in this temple. We will cry out to you because of our distress and you will hear and you will deliver. Does anybody recognize this? You've heard this before? Where where we heard this before? <clears throat> Moses. We heard it from Moses. More recently we heard it from who? It's a second Chronicles seven prayer. This is if my people who are called by my name. It's that prayer. This is the prayer of Solomon. Remember, I've told you before that if my people were called by my name, are not the, that's not the prayer. That's God's response to the prayer. The prayer is actually what this guy prayed right here. It's almost word for word what Solomon said. And what Solomon said was almost word for word what Moses said. Are you following? Yes? This is important. This, this prayer should sound ridiculously familiar to you. I want I want to, to make note that Jehoshaphat here prays a prayer we have become very familiar with in this church, and it was applicable since he prays it under the old covenant in regard to Israel and the land given to them by promise. This this whole land that they were in belonged to them. It was given to them by God. Every single inhabitant in the land were God's people. They were God's covenant people, right? I want you to notice as well that it began with a godly leader. It was not a request for one, right? In all three examples that we have of the prayer, it starts with a godly leader doing precisely this thing and praying precisely this way every single time. Now, picking up in verse 10. Now, here are the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir. See, I told you he was going to call them that, right? You did not let Israel invade them when Israel came out of the land of Egypt, but Israel turned away from them and did not destroy them. Look how they repay us by coming to drive us out of your possession that you gave us as an inheritance. O oh God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this vast multitude that comes to fight against us. We do not know what to do, but we look to you. Man, I'm telling you what, I like this guy. You, you know, leaders are, are not supposed to admit that they don't know what they're doing. You know, I mean, traditionally, that's usually not a good sign. Would you agree with me? Traditionally, you don't want a president coming up and say, I have no idea what to do. None. You, you, you don't want to hear that. No. What you want is a plan, right? <laughs> this guy comes up and in his prayer says, we're powerless against this great number, and we don't even know what to do. But our eyes are on you. 
This is a, a sign of tremendous humility before God. It is. It should be normal. It should be expected. But unfortunately, it has not been, right? But Jehoshaphat owns his weakness. By, by the way, that right there is the precursor to receiving grace, isn't it? God says that he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. What is this but an admission of humility? I can't, but you can, right? This, I mean, he's opening the door wide to receive the grace of God. Uh, Jehoshaphat is acting a lot like David, embracing his weakness so that he could be infused with God's strength. It's a timeless lesson of grace. You receive God's influence and power if you do not, in humility, uh, you cannot receive God's influence and power if you do not, in humility, first embrace your weakness and look to him in surrendered trust. And that is exactly what Jehoshaphat is doing here. Let's look at verse 13. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. In the midst of the congregation, the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, uh, uh, son of Jeel, son of Mataniah, a Levite from Asaph's descendants. Asaph being the one that, along with David, wrote some of the Psalms in the book of Psalm. And he said, listen carefully, all of Judea, Judea and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. That's the song we sing tonight, right? Tomorrow, go down against them. You will see them coming up the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley facing the wilderness of Jer um, Jeruel. Do not, you do not have to fight this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. Now, wow. God is so gracious and kind. This response of God from simply being in their midst, right? I mean, it says right there that the people and, and Jehoshaphat hadn't even got the words out their mouth before the Spirit of God was in their midst. Bam, right? Now, you and I, we've grown to expect that because he never leaves you and I, right? But that's the blessing of the new covenant. Not true under the old covenant, right? And so when these people prayed and cried out to God, now God's name was always there. His presence was always in the temple, but his spirit did not always manifest itself. Here, he did. And it was, it was in a direct response to the humility and the prayer and the cry for help that Jehoshaphat had initiated. His response, this response of God from simply being in their midst to the words he spoke remind me of one of my favorite statements um, that David, uh, in, uh, from David's Song of Deliverance found in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 36. We read it back when we were in that area. And Psalm 1835, it says, You also have given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You have enlarged my steps beneath me so that my feet did not slip. That's what this reminds me of. Because, you know, he's, he's God's, his, the gentle way God's dealing with them made Jehoshaphat great. He's being kind. He's being gentle with them. These people were loaded with fear and they cried out to God, deciding I'm going to trust God, even though at the moment the threat is still making my knees knock. I'm going to cry out to God. I'm putting all my eggs in one basket. I'm crying out to him and depending upon him. And God shows up. And the first words out of God's mouth is the same thing he often says to us. And that is, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. In fact, it bookends everything God said in this. If you go back and you read it, you'll find that, um, you know, God starts off with, don't be afraid and discouraged. And it's the last words out of his mouth too. Only don't be afraid and discouraged. 
So, I mean, he speaks to that twice because he knows their heart. And he wants to encourage them towards faith and towards surrender. I can be trusted. I've got this, right? Now, and God also steps in and owns the battle. He says, it's not yours. It's my battle, right? Uh, far from being the way God would deal with the ungodly and the wicked, like I said, you know, the Psalm uh, um, uh, 35 uh, no, I'm sorry, Psalm 18, verse uh, 35, talks about how God put, you know, established his steps, you know. You, you've broadened my feet and you've established my steps. Um, but if you look in other passages in the New Testament, the Old Testament, I mean, um, it talks about how with the wicked, God places their feet in slippery places. Not in a firm foundation, but in a place where they'll slip and fall. So it's the complete opposite of the way that God would deal with the wicked right? He's responding to Jehoshaphat as a righteous man. This may be God's response to Jehoshaphat's prayer, pointing out that it was God who did not allow them to destroy these people years ago. When God said, it's my battle, it's not yours, that may have been God just owning it and saying, yeah, you're right. I did not let you destroy them, and now it's come around to bite us in the rear. This is my problem, not yours. I got, it, I got you covered. He's owning it. Now, you know, you and I already know, because we've read towards the end of the book, we know in Acts 17, why did God did not allow Israel to destroy those people? Two reasons. The Ammonites, the Moabites, and the descendants of Edom, which are the descendants of Esau, are all extended family of Abraham. Right? So out of respect to Abraham and that lineage, he was not quick to treat them like he treated the Canaanites. Are you following but secondarily, according to Acts 17, when God allows people to continue on for a period of time in a nation, it's so that they might seek after God and find him, right? So God's giving these descendants of Abraham another chance. One more opportunity. Don't destroy them. They're your brothers, right? They weren't covenant people, but they were descendants of Abraham. So don't destroy them. So that was God's intention in telling them no when they left Egypt in the first place. But now, X number of years later, instead of all the time they were given resulting in them having sought the Lord and turned to him, now they're attacking God's people. And God's like, okay, we're done. We're done. I'm going to annihilate you now, mm -hmm. right? So God owns it. Uh, he says, uh, it's almost like uh, um, he's saying that, you know, they, they treated my mercy with hatred. And because of that, you're not going to deal with them, I will. Notice also that God is careful. He, he, as he always is, to settle their hearts. Like I said before, the first thing he brings up is don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. And it's the last thing he says as well. But I also want you to notice that uh, in, in the same way that God's words to Israel were bookended with encouragement, Jehoshaphat's actions, as well as Israel's, were bookended with, with worship. We'll see that in just a second. God's interaction with Israel and Jehoshaphat were bookended with encouragements towards don't free, be afraid and being don't be discouraged. And their response to God, both at the beginning and at the end, were worship. Worship, right? This is a proper relationship with God. So starting back in verse 18, it says, Then Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all Judea and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord to worship him. Then the Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel, shouting in a loud voice. <laughs> I mean, they went from fear to praise, right? Or rather, from fear to worship, to prayer, to worship, to praise, right? Uh, they, they, there was a continual surrender, but as soon as God spoke, they allowed that to be the final word about the matter. They had not gone into battle. They, that was still going to happen tomorrow for them. That was still in the future. But they were treating it as though they already had the victory because God spoke. He's not a man that he should lie. If he said it, he'll make it good, right? And so they began to praise him now. Not waiting until after. Praise him now. Because he's already spoken to this. He can be trusted, right? Now, faith is revealed in their hope. You can see it. 
by their, even their starting to praise alone. It shows that there was faith there. But starting in verse 20, it says, In the morning they got up early and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. As they were about to go out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. Then he consulted with the people and appointed some to sing for the Lord, and some to praise the splendor of his holiness. Now, up to this point, it doesn't say anything about God commanding that. I know the song we sang said that God told him to send the singers out in front of you. But this sounds like it was a decision of Jehoshaphat. You know, if, if we're not going to fight, we might as well praise. Right? <laughs> and notice the first thing he brings up is I want the first group, because there's two groups that are singing. The first group, I want you singing songs for God's pleasure. The second group, I want you extolling his holiness. Right? I mean, if God's gonna, if God's gonna fight for us, we might as well give him some, you know, some traveling music to listen to, right? We might as well show our gratitude and sing praises to him that he enjoys in the process, right? Because there's nothing else for us to do. We're not gonna fight. God's fighting. So what, uh, it, you know, the only reason for us to show up is good. God told us to. But if we're not gonna fight, we might as well just go ahead and send the singers ahead, right? So, the moment they began their shouts and praises, it says in verse 22, actually, let me back up to, let me back up and read verse 21 again, because I didn't read the fullness of it before. Um, then he consulted with the people and appointed some to sing for the Lord, and some to sing the splendor of his holiness. When they went out in front of the armed forces, they kept singing, giving thanks to the Lord, for his faithful love endures forever. The moment they began their shouts and praises, the Lord set an ambush against the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir, who came to fight against Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites turned against the inhabitants of Seir and completely annihilated them. When they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. Then Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, and they looked down towards the multitude, and there were corpses lying on the ground. Nobody had escaped. Then Jehoshaphat and his people went to gather the plunder. They found among them an abundance of goods on the bodies and valuable items. So they stripped them until nobody could carry any more, and were, gather and, uh, were gathering the plunder for three full days because there was so much. They assembled in the valley of Baraka, or Baraka, uh, on the fourth day. For there, uh, for there they praised the Lord. Therefore, that place is still called the valley of Baraka today. And some of you may remember that particular word, um, from a song we used to sing from, uh, uh Paul Wilbur called Baraka Ba. Baraka means blessing. So it was the valley of blessing. Verse 27, then all the men of Judah and Jerusalem turned back with Jehoshaphat at their head, returning joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord enabled them to rejoice over their enemies. So they came into Jerusalem, the Lord's temple, with harps, lyres, and trumpets. The terror of the Lord, or meaning in other words, the deep respect for the Lord, was on all of the kingdoms of the land, and they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Then Jehoshaphat's kingdom was quiet, for God gave him rest on every side. Now, I, I want to go ahead and just throw something in here as well that I, I don't even have in my notes, but it occurs to me at this moment. And that is that it seems to me, because God is sovereign in the affairs of man, that, and we've seen it already in times past, that God is the one who has the power to give peace on every side. Or in other words, Kingdoms who would otherwise naturally have decided to attack you now will decide not to because he made it that way. He forced the issue. How God does that, I don't know. All I know is that the Bible says that whenever a king, because of his righteous acts, enjoyed peace, it says it's because God gave him peace on every side, essentially not allowing anyone to attack him. 
You also notice, therefore, that the opposite would stand to be true. That if someone does rise up against you, it was probably a God's provocation. Are you following? Mm -hmm. So, it makes sense to me. I'm not claiming this is true. I'm saying it makes sense to me. That, remember, when Jehoshaphat was returning from the, ba the battle with Ahab against Ramah Gilead, the prophet came out against him and confronted him and said, you know what? Do you love God's enemies more than you love God? Why have you allowed yourself, why do you allow, uh, allow yourself to get allied with kings that I didn't tell you to get allied with? And it says, because of that, God's wrath is upon you. Nevertheless, he's found good in you in that you've destroyed the idols and stuff like that. So God, God has a tendency to treat the evil for what it is and the good for what it is. It's very possible that God is the one that stirred these people up to go in and be destroyed in the first place. Just like he stirred Ahab to be, uh, to be um, encouraged to go into battle that he might be destroyed. God obviously stirred up the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the, um, the inhabitants of Mount Seir to come up against this king. But, so he would not, that was right there, it, it, it gave Jehoshaphat an opportunity to either be afraid or trust God. It was a test. It was also bringing a form of judgment against him. But because Jehoshaphat had, since that time, and even before that bad situation with Ahab, had always set his, his heart to seek the Lord, God did not allow him to be destroyed because Jehoshaphat responded in faith, right? So you have God bringing judgment and God also bringing deliverance all in the exact same action. Because there's one thing you also notice with God, I have at least so far since Genesis all the way up till now, is God has to, seems to have an economy of expressions of power. He doesn't show miraculous power unless he absolutely has to. And when he does, he usually is trying to do multiple things with one action. He's not doing one brand new action for each situation. It's like he tries to do as many things with one action as possible. And, uh, and so I would imagine that's probably what's taking place here. Verse 30 says, Then Jehoshaphat's kingdom was quiet, for God gave him rest on every side. Jehoshaphat became king over Judah, was 35 years old when he became king. He reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, uh, daughter of Shilai. He walked in the ways of Asa, his father, who, if you remember, was a godly king. He did not turn away from it, but did what was right in the Lord's sight. However, the high places were not taken away. The people had not yet determined in their hearts to worship the God of their ancestors. Now, this may mean at least one of two different things. It may mean that they worshipped other gods, but I'm not convinced that's what this means. Uh, not from the words and not from the surrounding text, because just a minute ago you have all of Israel very quick to respond, very quick to worship God, to praise Him, to be in faith, to trust the Lord. Uh, and also, you know, Jehoshaphat had already gone through all the provinces and turned the people's hearts towards the Lord and destroyed the idols. So if they don't have any idols, what are they worshiping aside from God? You know what I mean? So I, I, I don't think that that's what it meant, what it means here. And let me help explain a little bit more. Uh, it, unless it is otherwise clearly stated someplace else in scripture that I'm unaware of, they may have maintained God as the focus of their religious service but failed to truly worship him by not following the commandments regarding the temple and the sacrifices offered in Jerusalem. They knew that if they were supposed to worship God, they were supposed to travel to Jerusalem, where God had placed his name, offer sacrifices in that place, right? And, uh, and, but instead, they were still offering sacrifices on the high places, which is what they were doing during David's reign when there wasn't a temple, Right? God allowed it for a period of time because there wasn't a place to offer it. And ever since David, the people just never stopped. They felt at liberty to worship God the way they wanted to. I mean, they were offering the right sacrifices and they were doing all the right things, but they were doing it in the wrong place. And so they might have been doing the right thing, but they're doing it the wrong way. And so it wasn't really worship. It was religious service. Are you following? 
That that's my spin on it. I could be wrong. Maybe there were idols involved, but I have a hard time understanding how there can be idols involved and them all being destroyed at the same time. So very likely this was exactly what God God wasn't happy about it. We know he wasn't happy about it during the days the times of David. But he allowed it because of the fact that there was no temple. Now there was, and God was not happy. He was happy that they that their hearts wanted to to serve him on some level, but he was not happy that they were unwilling to follow his word, right? So, uh, you know, all good intentions aside, if you don't do what God actually says, it can't really be regarded as true worship. So anyway, uh, with that having been said, verse, we go to verse 34. The rest of the events of Jehoshaphat's reign from beginning to end are written about in the events of Jehu, son of Han Hananiah, uh, which is recorded in the book of Israel's kings. Now we're going to go on to verse 35. Uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. Verse 35, after this, Judah's king, Jehoshaphat, made an alliance with Israel's king, Ahaziah. Now, Ahaziah, if you remember, that was Ahab's son, one of Ahab's sons, who took the throne after Ahab had just died. We didn't see anything about his inauguration in here, but it did take place. Okay, So after all these events, Jehoshaphat makes an alliance with Israel's king, Ahaziah, who was guilty of wrongdoing. Jehoshaphat formed an alliance with him to make ships to go to Tarshish, and they made the ships in Ezon Geber. The, then Eleazar, son of Dodavahu, I guess that's how you say that, of, of Mirshah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you formed an alliance with Ahaziah, the Lord has broken up what you have made. So the ships were wrecked and were not able to go to Tarshish. Now, you may not remember all of this, but way back in David's reign and also in Solomon's, they had a fleet that did just that and went to Tarshish uh, in order to go to, I think it was Opal, in order to get gold. That's what they were doing. And so he was just following the footsteps of previous kings and made a fleet to go and get gold. And in order to make it easier, he allied with the ungodly king of Israel to make it happen, right? So um, this was a, a bad thing for him to do. So anyway, he says, uh, the rest of the events of Jehoshaphat's reign from beginning to end, or, or, or I already read that, I'm sorry. Um, now, now we're going to pick up in, in 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 10 to 22. Uh, another thing I didn't bring up earlier was another proof, I believe, that Jehoshaphat was intimidated by Ahab was because Jehoshaphat had made an alliance with that with King Ahab by having his son marry Ahab's daughter, something we didn't cover. Mm -hmm. It's part of natural history, but and it is, I think, brought up in one place, but um, but it, we haven't covered that yet. But I just want to make sure that you knew that that, uh, that, again, was proof that he's doing everything he can to make sure that he maintains some type of peace. He was a, he was a peacekeeper, not a peacemaker. So he's like, you know what? Uh, he's less likely to attack me if his daughter's married to my son, right? And so that's right. what he did. So now in 1 Kings chapter 22, we're going to pick up in verse 41 because we ended in 2240 last, uh, last time. And it says, again, 1 Kings 22 verse 41, Jehoshaphat, son of Asa, became king over Judah in the 14th year of Israel's king Ahab. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king. He reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuba, daughter of Silhai. He walked in all the ways of his father Asa. He did not turn away from them, but did what was right in the Lord's sight. However, the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on those high places. It doesn't say they offered it to ungodly false gods. It just says that's where they did their worship, right? So I think that's that's the most likely what was happening. Verse 44, Jehoshaphat also made peace with the king of Israel. The rest of the events of Jehoshaphat's reign, along with the might he, um, the might he exercised and how he waged war, are written about in the historical record of Judah's kings. He removed from the land the rest of the male shrine prostitutes who were left from the days of his father Asa. He w there was no king in Edom. A deputy served as king. Jehoshaphat made ships of, of, of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold. But they did not go because the ships were wrecked at Ezon Geber. At that time, Ahaziah, son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with your ser uh, servants in the ships. 
but Jehoshaphat was not willing. Now, that, that's, that's a good thing. Eventually, Ahab, um, Jehoshaphat found his voice. Up to this point, he has been doing nothing but capitulating to the kings of Israel and caving in to them and doing everything he can to, to keep the peace. But this time, uh, Ahaziah went too far by saying, you know what, let my people go with your people. And to Jehoshaphat, that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. And he said, no, no, we're done. I'm not letting that happen. So Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his father in the city of his forefather, David. His son Je Jehoram became king in his place. Ahaziah, son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Judah's king Jehoshaphat. He reigned over Israel two years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He walked in the way of his father, in the way of his mother, and in the way of Jer Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had caused Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him. He provoked the Lord uh, God of Israel just as his father had done. So, now this next section we're about to read is found in 1 Kings chapter 21, starting in verse 20, starting in verse 21. And you can, may remember that God had spoken uh, in the past. I'm, I'm reading this back. We're going back a little bit. You don't have to turn there yourself. I'm reading this because what we're about to read in the next section qualifies, is qualified by this passage. If you remember, God had spoken destruction upon Ahab long before he died way before he died. Um, he had said, Terry, it looks like you're trying to get my attention, are you? Okay, because I can't find my glasses, and so therefore I cannot uh, see you. So I don't know. They're right on your left. On my left. In the chair and the couch. Oh, they're the on the floor? Yeah. Oh, that's why I can't see them. Yeah, I see them now. Thank you. Um, okay, sorry about that. Back up. Sorry, trying to find my place again. <clears throat> now, like I said, you may remember that God had spoken destruction upon Ahab and his descendants, but then commanded a ver of the verdict to um, uh, to be commuted uh, to the reign of his son due to the fact that Ahab repented. I don't know if you remember that happening, but I'm going to read it to you now. It was found in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 21 through 22, and then verse 28 through 29. It says, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to bring disaster on you, meaning Ahab, and will sweep away your descendants. I will eliminate all of Ahab's males, both slave and free, in Israel. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of ba Basha, son of Ahijah, because you have provoked my anger and caused Israel to sin. Verse 28. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? I will now not bring the disaster during his lifetime. See, he's commuting it, right? I will not bring the disaster during his lifetime because he has humbled himself before me. But I will bring the disaster on his at the house. Uh, I'm sorry, on his house during his son's lifetime. So what we're about to read about uh, Ahaziah, Ahab's son. Now you have a context for it. Because God said, I'm going to do this in the lifetime of his son. Okay, so now we're in 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1. Starting in verse 1, it says, After the death of, death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Ahaziah had fallen through a latticed window of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers instructing them, Go inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, if I will recover from this injury. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Go and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, Is it because there is no god in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says You will not get up from your sickbed, you will certainly die. Then Elijah left. The messengers returned to the king, who asked them, Why have you come back? 
They replied, A man came to meet us and said, Go back to the king who sent you and declare to him, This is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending these men to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore, you, do, you will not get up from your sickbed. You will certainly die. The king asked them, What sort of man came to meet you and spoke those words to you? They replied, A hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. He said, It's Elijah the Tishbite. So King Ahaziah set, sent a captain of fifty with his fifty men to Elijah. When the captain went up to meet him, he was sitting on top of the hill. He announced, Man of God, the king declares, Come down. Elijah responded to the captain of the fifty, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them and his fifty men. So the king sent another captain of fifty with his fifty men to Elijah. He took the situation and announced, Man of God, this is what the king says, Come down immediately. Elijah responded, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. So a divine fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty men. Then the king sent yet a third captain of fifty with his fifty men. The third captain of fifty went up and fell on his knees in front of Elijah and begged him, Man of God, please let my life and the life of these fifty servants of yours be precious in your sight. Already fire has come down from heaven and consumed the first two captains of fifty with their fifties. But I, have, but this time, let my life be precious in your sight. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, can you see a difference in the way these guys approached him? The first two, now they were acting on behalf of the king, but they were also being more than a little pushy and demanding with the prophet, right? Commanding him to come down. This guy comes in humility. Then Elijah said, uh, I'm sorry, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he got, uh, got up and went down with, uh, with him to the king. Then Elijah said to King Ahaziah, this is what the Lord says. Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no god in Israel for you to inquire of his will? Will you not get up, you will not get up from the sickbed, you will certainly die. Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Since he had no son, Joram became king in his place. This happened in the second year of Judah, uh, Judah's king Jer Jehoram, uh, son of Jehoshaphat. The rest of the events of Ahaziah's reign, along with his accomplishments, are written about in the historical record of Israel's kings. Now, I want you to notice that, now, I think as far as months are concerned, the totality of his reign was literally about a year. But because it spanned two years, meaning like from 2019 to 2020, it's recorded as two years, okay? But I think that the actual months were probably about within a year. All right. Uh, now, the last thing uh, I was going to read the next part, but because we started late and it's already seven thirty, I'll pick that up next time. That's going to be Second Kings chapter two. We're going to start talking about um, the uh, Elijah and Elisha. Uh, Elijah is taken from us, and Elisha takes his place. But um, so anyway, I, hopefully that uh, gave you a good rendition of all that what took place and during the rest of Ahab and Jehoshaphat's reign, and of course Ahab's king, uh, I mean, uh, son, who reigned in his place. And there was a lot of good lessons in there too. Uh, but I, I love Jehoshaphat's heart. I mean, Jehoshaphat had a good heart. Uh, he did some things that were, he's a guy that we can kind of identify with, kind of like David, who did a lot of good things, but also didn't do everything right, you know? And now, the one thing I do want to point out that I haven't said up to this point, but I want to really stress tonight, is that even though the actions of Jehoshaphat are very, very much like the actions of David, there's nothing said about Jehoshaphat that would put him on a level like David in God's eyes. When you see David, he's a man after God's own heart. That's never said about Jehoshaphat. And it's not because his actions weren't the same, because 
by and large, they were. I mean, he went through the land and he saw two of the people's hearts were turned towards the Lord and he cried out to the Lord during times of despair and he trusted him and all that. And sure, he did a few things that weren't right, but you know what? He never murdered anybody and took their wife like David did, right? All he did was kind of cave into some peer pressure and align himself with a, a king of Israel. It's not like he aligned himself with an ungodly king from another nation that wasn't part of the covenant. He just allied himself with a brother that wasn't walking righteously and doing terrible. Well, now, granted, Ahab was as good as any wicked king, if not worse. But nonetheless, this was, you can look at the two lives and you're like, you know, I, I kind of think Ahab kind of did a better job in some respects. I'm not sure I follow why uh, there's so much praise given to David and very little given to Jeroboam. There's an acknowledgement that he followed the Lord and that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and so on, but nothing really beyond that. And I think it's my personal opinion, and I own that. I, I always tell you when it's my opinion, and it is my opinion. Nothing more than that, so it's not really a substantive, but I think it's worth considering I think that the difference between Jehoshaphat and David was the fact that I think that Jehoshaphat followed the Lord from a sense of duty and because he believed it was right, a place of moral conviction. I don't think that he fell in love with the Lord. David, on the other hand, his devotion to God was driven by his love. You hear it all, I mean, you hear it all the time. And David can hardly talk about the Lord without talking about how his love, his love for him and his acknowledgement of God's love for him back. So it comes through David's mouth all the time. And, and yet the same, the same people wrote Kings and Second Chronicles, the part of the story that includes David's life, as the people that recorded Jehoshaphat's life. And they never bring up Jehoshaphat ever saying anything about his love for God. His obedience, his respect, his desire from an inward compelling of his conscience to do what was right, but not, nothing about love. And I think that that might be a deciding factor. Just like God lets every action stand on its own. If you do what is right, I'll acknowledge it. If you do what is wrong, I'll judge you for it, right? Right? In the same way, God also pays attention to the reasons that you do what you do. And don't get me wrong, Ahab's reasons were not bad reasons. Moral conviction and a fear of the Lord are good things, without question. And it provoked devotion out of him, no question. But I don't see a lot of signs of love. And again, I tell you, I already know, I'm, I'm speaking by permission. I'm not saying that I know that for a fact. There just seems to be no evidence of it. That's all I'm saying. And it just seems like if the same people are recording these events, that if there was something there that was obvious about his love, like there was for David, it would have shown up. And it just doesn't. So um, I think that that says a lot. God honored him. I have no doubt that Jehoshaphat is with the Lord today and we'll, we'll spend an eternity with him. Uh, just like we do with David, but I think the testimony is is considerably less than it could have been, and I do believe that love was the deciding factor. So, uh, so that having been said, I, I open the floor to anybody who has questions or statements, uh, even those that are joining us remotely. Uh, go ahead. Yes. I I think if I remember properly, uh, I'm not looking at that particular portion of the scripture. Hopefully, you are. Um, But if I remember properly, that was in regard to the people going out and singing ahead of the army. Is that correct? Okay. I think the reason was because of the fact that... Yeah, I I think the reason was because it was a decision of Ahab to show gratitude to God for his 
uh, for his faithful love, for his devotion to Israel and uh, or Judah particularly in being their deliverer, even though they hadn't seen it yet. Um, it was clearly not a command of God. Like I, like I kind of pointed out earlier, the song that we sang that um, of Ron Canoli's about the battle is the Lord, which is a great song. I very much like it. But it puts it in the song as though God commanded the singers to go before them. But these biblical accounts don't give, me, give that account at all. God never one time said, now make sure singers go out ahead of them. I believe it was because Ahab was uh, was just responding out of what he felt was the right thing to do from a religious devotion standpoint. If you can lower that sound for me. Um, yeah, huh? It's her. Yeah, I know, but if you can turn down your volume so that it doesn't come across. Um, uh, I believe that that's, I believe that's what it is because nowhere in the passage did God say, now I'm commanding you, you send your people who've got flutes and lyres and banjos and stuff like that in front of the men of war. Um, it was a decision of Ahab's. And so, um, and I think it was a decision of just deciding to honor God in song and in praise because of God's deliverance. And so there wasn't a need to consult with God. This was a, this was like a, it's very, it would be very much like a, a voluntary offering. Like when you gave a heave offering or gave a wave offering or whatever, it was not something that was required of you. Uh, it's something that you gave because you wanted to. And I think that was very much what this praise was. So um, that would be my, my default belief anyway. That's probably why he consulted with the people as to who would sing what and and who would go with who would go in what group. Uh, I think that's probably the reason because God didn't order it. It was just something he was doing to honor God in respect towards him. So, uh, but it's a good question. In fact, it caught my eye. I was going through it as well. So, uh, Great. Grace. 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 